So um, I'm excited for this talk. Um, I'm going to be discussing how to be a great peer reviewer of scientific manuscripts. And uh, this, you know, it really dovetails with also just being a good author. So if the two go hand in hand, so if you already are an excellent uh, manuscript writer and researcher, um, you also, I'm sure you're also a great peer reviewer. So I'm just going to go through some of the things that um, I've learned over time. And just to let you know uh, where I'm coming from, uh, for the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery, I'm an associate statistical editor. Uh, for the Annals of Thoracic Surgery, I'm an editorial board member, and those are our two, really our two main journals for CT surgery. And then I'm a section editor for patient reported outcomes in the Journal of Surgical Oncology. And then kind of adjacent or related positions are the STS uh, Participant Use File General Thoracic Review Committee. So I review proposals that come through requesting to use the data from the database and also um, any manuscripts that are uh, going for publication as a result of using the, the PUF files. I'll, I also review abstracts every year for the STS, AATS, and the STSA meetings. Those are all thoracic surgery meetings. And then lastly, um, I've been on the Society of General Thoracic, Society of Thoracic Surgeons uh, database task force for a long time now. So with that, we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, as an overview, I want to talk about the peer review process. We're going to talk about you know, section specific elements of manuscripts. And I'm going to keep kind of um, dovetailing in what I call the symmetrical scientific manuscript, and then a bit on grammar, because it really does matter. And then at the end, actually responding to reviewer comments. So the peer review process, as you're all well aware, uh, scientists study something and they write it up, they submit it to a journal, that manuscript goes straight to the the editor of the journal, who then sends it out for peer review. Typically, it'll go to an associate editor who then assigns it to several reviewers. The reviewers read the article and provide their own feedback to the editor. The editor then reviews all the peer reviews and then uh, makes a, a decision and sends it back to the, the authors. Uh, most of the time, the recommendation is to revise the manuscript and then resubmit it. Uh, and then hopefully it eventually gets uh, published in, uh, in the journal. So the, what are the criteria? These, so these are common questions that are within like the, what we call editorial manager, which is the website that um, peer reviewers and editors log into to access uh, the manuscripts to, for review and to communicate with the authors uh, and the editorial team. So they'll ask about originality and the importance of the study. A lot of times, uh, you know, some, some of the final decisions come down to, is this manuscript going to contribute to the literature in a novel way? Or have we seen this before? Um, also organization, readability, use of the English language. Uh, a lot of our journals uh, receive, and a lot of journals overall receive uh, high volume submissions from um, scientists whose first language is not English. And so sometimes language editing is needed. We also are asked about study design methods, analyses, and really important that the IRB statement is included. And then conclusions, limitations, and future directions. The main uh, hang up is primarily are the authors making conclusions that aren't supported by the results or are what we say overstating your results. And so that um, oftentimes it's easy to get excited about your, your study and perhaps overstate the findings. And sometimes that just needs to be dialed back a little bit um, to avoid, you know, publishing something uh, with a really strong recommendation if, you know, perhaps the methods weren't, um, you know, can't all do randomized control trials. And then literature review, completeness and relevancy. Uh, a lot of people that are reviewing these manuscripts have been in the field for a long time. So I, I always enjoy reading the peer reviews of um, people who have been in the field for 20 or 30 years because they provide a lot of background and they know um, uh, a, a lot of the literature. And so they'll be the first ones to point out, you know, you didn't cite this article or that article. And I, I would recommend, and this came from my PI when I was in the lab, avoid stating to our knowledge, this is the first study. Because if you did an adequate literature review, you'll know if you're the first or not. Um, so I, I usually request that people revise that. Um, and then clarity of tables and figures and how the data are presented is key. 
And then last but not least, the is, is it formatted correctly? So really following the author instructions for the journals, it's important. Typically, reviewers will be asked to rate the manuscript on a numeric scale, zero to 10, zero to 100. And then there'll be maybe a question regarding what's the priority for publication? So sometimes it'll say high priority, low priority, or publish if space is available. And then we have to make sure these are, are the following needed. Is the IRB statement there? Do, do you as a reviewer think that this uh, manuscript needs language editing? And is a statistical review needed? And then there can be, um, you know, then the, the meat of it is really the comments that the peer reviewer makes to the authors and then the comments to the editor. Those are confidential, the authors can't read it. But I recommend anytime you're peer reviewing to always, you know, send a direct message to the editor. They appreciate it. Just a note on this, I think you're, you're all well aware, but it's important to adhere to the guide for authors of the journal to which you are submitting your manuscript in terms of formatting and so forth, um, it'll just it'll just really save you some time in the long run. Oh, let's go back a slide. So focus is is key. Um, you know, I when I think about writing a paper and I think about doing a research project, uh, it's it's really easiest, honestly, to think of one research question, one and only, one outcome, perhaps one predictor, compare two groups, and come up with the you know, what's your one question? What's your primary aim? And then have a hypothesis. And you can and have you can have secondary aims and you can have subgroup analyses. But if you focus everything around one question, it'll be a lot easier to do the analyses and write the manuscript. So it's not uncommon, I'll give you an example, to see something like the purpose of this study is to examine the outcomes of patients undergoing robot assisted versus VATS lobectomy. So uh, examining outcomes is very vague. That tells me that maybe you went to a database and you saw what outcomes were available and then you started doing analyses to figure out where the exciting associations were and then wrote a paper about it. So are you really interested in survival or readmissions or complications? You know, just, just pick one. You can do the other analyses, but if you pick one, it'll be much, much easier. So I'll give you an example. It's a paper I did about, I don't know, maybe five years ago. So our primary aim, we were studying carcinoid tumors, was to determine the effect of the extent of resection and lymph node assessment on overall survival in patients with clinical stage T1A N0 M0 typical carcinoid. Because when I was in training, I saw some people do some extensive resections, or I should say lobes for these. And I saw other people just do a wedge resection and not take any lymph nodes. And then I thought, you know, is there a difference? What do we really need to be doing for these, you know? relatively in, indolent cancers, although still cancer. So we hypothesized that overall survival would be similar for patients undergoing subloper resection compared to lobectomy, but if no lymph node assessment was done, we thought that would decrease survival. And then the secondary aims were to compare the extent of resection and lymph node assessment according to the tumor size. So did tumor size matter in terms of what the decision surgeons made? And then also treatment facility type. So what were the... Um, you know, comprehensive cancer centers doing versus uh, community cancer centers and so forth. So the introduction sets the stage for what I call symmetry throughout the manuscript, because if you really, um, your manuscript should flow and the reader shouldn't be surprised anywhere beyond the introduction as to what they're gonna, what the findings are gonna be or what the methods or what, you know, or even what the conclusions are gonna be because you're gonna set that stage here and tell them what to expect. And so, the introduction really has two purposes. One is you want to attract the reader. You want to make it exciting, get them interested, and then let them know what to expect, give them a roadmap. And there's four key elements. And this, this helps me focus my introductions when I write papers. What's the background of the research question? What is the prior research in that area? What were the problems with the prior research? And then what did you do to fix those problems? And you're gonna see, I'm gonna to refer to this uh, uh, book by Browner, uh, Dr. Browner at UCSF. It's, I think, kind of the best book on publishing and presenting clinical research, and it's a really easy read. And so as a general rule, um, you leave out any information that doesn't fit into one of those four categories. And that's how you prevent writing kind of a, a meandering introduction. Then you get to the methods and there's, there's four more important elements of that. So it's the study design, who or what you studied, who are the participants, what measurements did you make, 
and what statistical analyses did you do? And again, this is where the symmetry is key because if you mention something in the results section, then you must describe how you measured it or analyzed or came to that result in the method section. So sometimes when I review, I read the methods and I know, I think I know what to expect. And then in the results section, there will be things that were done that weren't described in the method section. So that's, that's a missing link. And if you describe something in the method section, well, then by all means, present the results. So every item in the method section should have a corresponding item in the results section. And, you, and it's actually best to, when you write your paper, to do it in that order. So the first, you know, the methods, first paragraph is going to talk about the cohort. Well, the first paragraph of your results section is going to talk about what the cohort consists of and refer to table one. And so using the example of the carcinoid study that we did, it was a retrospective cohort study using the National Cancer Database. So it was our study design. We described uh, that we studied patients with clinical stage T1A, N0, M0, typical carcinoid tumor undergoing surgical resection between 1998 and 2012. We, uh, you also state your exclusions and your inclusions. So we stated that we used patients who had an eight millimeter, eight millimeters with our lower tumor size cutoff. And the NCCN, and the reason why we did that was because the NCCN recommends further evaluation of solid nodules that are greater than or equal to eight millimeters. So that gives us a, a group of patients who are likely to have something that's going to be done because um, their tumor size is greater than or equal to eight. So always explain your rationale because that's gonna preempt um, the questions that you have from the reviewers. Cause some reviewers gonna ask you, well, why did you, why did you choose eight millimeters? And then your measurements. So our predictor variables were the extent of lymph node assessment. And you know, you can you can analyze things a couple different ways. We analyze this as either yes or no, either it was done or it wasn't done. And then we also analyzed it based on zero, uh, one to nine, and 10 or more lymph nodes because um, there's data to suggest that for a lung cancer resection, you should have at least, um, you should sample at least 10 lymph nodes. Um, and then again, one of our other predictor variables was was lobectomy or sublobar resection. And our outcome variable, our primary outcome was overall survival. And then lastly, just gonna mention that when you um, have composite outcomes, you really gotta describe those. And in particular, any, any novel predictors or outcomes that are not common. Everyone knows overall survival, everyone knows readmission. But uh, for example, uh, like the University of Michigan group has kind of set the tone and defined new persistent opioid use after surgery, which is patients who are opioid naive before surgery, and then filled a prescription for opioids after surgery, and then filled another one 90 days later. So just describe, you describe everything. You keep yourself um, ahead of the review. And then in the results section, this is just very basic. There's cohort demographics. Table one is typically that. It's typically three columns, overall cohort, and then if you're comparing two groups, the two groups, so maybe those who are readmitted, the demographics, and those who were not, or whatever your two groups may be. Then you present your main finding, your primary outcome, your secondary outcomes, and then any subgroup analyses. I'd recommend uh, taking a look at this uh, website called the Equator Network, and it's enhancing the quality and transparency of, and transparency of health research. And uh, there are reporting guidelines for study types. So they all have an acronym associated with them. And if you click on, for example, consort or strobe, it'll bring up a checklist. And this is the checklist of items that should be included in reports of cohort studies. So it's the strobe statement. And if you just printed this up and went, if you had a cohort study and you went through and made sure that you reported on each, each and every one of these, then you're already one step ahead of the curve. And I have seen reviewers uh, say, actually type to um, the author, you need to download the strobe checklist and make sure that you've included all of these items. So I've, I have seen that uh, several reviewers do that. Moving on to just a little bit about expressing your data and sort of, um, and so this is the results section, tables and figures, we all love them. Um, you know, but I'll admit, even with a lot of data that I see and that I'm putting together, I can get kind of overwhelmed with, well, how am I going to put this together? What am I going to do? 
So, you know, really try to put all your numbers and tables and figures and then use the text to explain them. So, so many times you see all the same numbers and p-values in a table that you see in, in the text of the results. Now you could save yourself a lot on the word count if you just re just refer the reader to the tables and figures, they should be looking at them. Um, so if you avoid repeating them, it'll be helpful because it's also kind of, um, it can get kind of uh, challenging to read a bunch of numbers when we're used to reading words. So tables present data in a nice compact form. You get get side-by-side -side comparisons of groups. And I put this little parking um, icon here because Warren Browner says in his book that some authors treat tables like parking lots as a convenient place to store uh, large amounts of data. So don't just make a table just because you think, oh my gosh, I have to present all these, every single piece of data and every data point and every analysis I did has to somehow get in a table. It doesn't. In fact, you don't even have to present every little single thing that you, um, that you analyze, only the things that are critical and relevant. And then for figures, you know, flow diagrams are good for sampling schemes and protocols and algorithms. Bar graphs are great for cat uh, results by categories of participants. Line graphs are great for changes over time. And then bar and whisker plots show distribution of data. These are actually underused. Um, and I see a lot of times the editor actually asks for this. And you make sure you include the, the confidence intervals on those too. And just simple stuff like presenting data. This is this, these are not real data, but it's it's open and robot assisted comparing some sort of operation. And you can see here I say, well, data are presented as mean and standard deviation or number and percentage. And I got some p-values. Well, what if I updated this table and made it look like that? I think that is a little bit easier to read. So I think uh, a lot of times people tend to get caught up in science and being super accurate and including a lot of numbers, but you know, you can round, um, it's okay to round, it's okay to do so. It makes for a cleaner, um, you know, presentation of your data. And then also some of these data that are not normally distributed, actually all of them should be presented as median and interquartile range. And I'll get to more on that in a bit. And when, when you have descriptive results, it's just basically it's just one variable. So if you have dichotomous data, it, there's just only two possible values. It's either a yes or a no. Um, most of you are familiar with categorical data. There's a limited number of mutually exclusive groups. So they can be ordered or they can be nominal, which is not ordered groups. And then we all know continuous data as well. There's an infinite number of values. And there's different ways to present these. So dichotomous data is typically N with a percent. And I'll give you an example. So we found that 12% of patients had poor health, 23% had fair health, and 41% good health. But I think this is a little more robust. Of the 331 patients, 12% N equals 40 reported poor health and so forth. This just gives you a much richer uh, indication of what's going on with the cohort. And it also helps you because this may be the whole cohort or the entire cohort, or it may be a subset. So one thing that I find myself doing sometimes is trying to figure out how many patients are in the total cohort. And if there's a subgroup analysis, making sure that all those patients actually made it into the analysis. And so the numbers really need to add up as well. So risk, odds, and rate. So a lot of times these, um, these may or may not be presented accurately. These are estimates of the frequency of a dichotomous outcome in a group of patients who were followed over time. Now, each of these three has the same numerator. It's the number who developed the outcome. Risk is the number who developed the outcome over the number at, at total number at risk. Odds is those who develop the outcome over those who do not develop the outcome. And then rate is those who develop the outcome over person time at risk. So it's the total amount of time that people were at risk. Um, okay, descriptive results continue. So continuous data. I wanna also really highlight this because uh, I see this all the time where um, there's a common trend towards reporting continuous data all the time as mean and standard deviation. And you can only, you should only do that if the data are normally distributed like the histogram on the right. If you have skewed data or data that are not normally distributed, you have to uh, describe them as a median and interquartile range. 
And then moving, moving along to analytic results, this is when you've actually done an analysis to um, compare two or more variables or groups. And it effect size is everything. So a lot of times you'll be reading a manuscript and you'll see a p-value, a couple of p-values, but really there's no, there's no actual result associated with it. And so effect size is really the quantitative measure of the magnitude of the difference between the two groups. And the p-value and the confidence interval should really just only play supporting roles. So I'll give me an example. What if I said in the study that I presented earlier, if I said in the multivariable model, the independent predictors of death were age with the p-value point less than 0.01 and lymph node upstaging. And I only gave you p-values. That doesn't really tell you anything about the effect of age and lymph node upstaging on death. But if I said this paragraph, you see that there's a 7% increased risk of death for every year increase in age and that those patients who had lymph node upstaging had a 3.45 greater times risk of death than those who did not. So when you present the data, um, you know, present the, the effect size, which is gonna be the hazard ratio, the, R, the odds ratio, and then you, know, you see you don't even need the p-value because if your confidence interval does not cross you know, one, then you know it's statistically significant. And I also wanted to mention, I know we're partway through this, but um, you feel free to write things in the chat because I can we can stop and uh, answer questions as we go as well because I have the I'm monitoring the chat as well. So multivariable analyses are really common these these days uh, it's, uh, and have been for a long time. It's probably the most common analysis that we do. And so is a general rule of thumb, a multivariable model can include one variable for every 10 outcomes. So if you have 200 patients with a 30-day readmission, you can actually include 20 variables in your model. Um, present multivariable analysis results in a table. And this is important. I see a lot of tables of a multivariable analysis and only, only the variables that ended up being statistically significant are included in the table, but then we don't know what other variables were adjusted for. So it's really key to include all variables in the final model, because that way the reader knows well, these are all the things that were adjusted for, and these, and then these were the variables that ended up being statistically significant or independent predictors of the outcome, and these others were not. Linear regression um, is, is used when your outcome is a continuous variable, and if you use that sort of regression, you should report the regression coefficients, the standard errors of the coefficients, and the p-values and then adjusted R2, which is a test of how well the model accounts for the outcome. Uh, logistic regression is, is probably the most common. It's a dichotomous variable as an outcome. And we report odds ratios, 95% confidence intervals, and p-values. Cox proportional hazards, the outcome is a hazard rate. We report hazard ratios, 95% confidence intervals, and p-values. A note on p-values. Um, I find myself uh, responding uh, to authors and uh, about this a lot. Report the actual p-value uh, rather than not significant or less than 0.05. If the p-value is greater than 0.01, then the p-value should always be expressed to two digits whether or not it is significant. Three digits is okay if rounding would change the significance of a value. If, it, if the p-value is less than 0.01, one, then the p-value should be expressed to three digits. And then for all that are less than 0 0.001, just report less than 0 0.001. So I actually looked this up because I was wondering what the, what the rules were, because a lot of times what you see is a lot, of, a lot of digits. And if you can cut down on some of those digits, it's just easier to read and it doesn't change the, doesn't change the meaning. Kaplan-Meier curves are, you know, uh, comparing typically two treatment groups or two groups in terms of their survival over time. Um, include the log rank test result, which is going to be the p-value of the test indicating whether or not there's a statistically significant difference between these two curves. And then over time, uh, underneath your curve, you should include this number at risk so that we know at each of these time points how many people are left in each group uh, over time. 
And then getting past the results, then you know, you're gonna conclude with your, your comment or your discussion section, whatever the, the journal calls it. And these are the main findings of the study. So what are the main findings? You start with your, your primary finding, your secondary, and then your subgroup analyses. And this is really time to think, what do you think your results mean and why they matter? And actually how strongly do you believe them? You need to avoid overstating the results and be careful about avoid, you know, avoid assigning causality when you only demonstrated an association. So really important to know um, the strengths and limitations of your analyses so that you can appropriately um, you know, state the uh, significance of your results. And then how do your results compare with those of prior studies? And then what are the limitations of your study? And then how do they impact your results? So a lot of times um, authors will write about limitations that are ret it's a retrospective study. Well, how is that a limitation? How is that, how did that actually impact your results? So if you can take it one step further by indicating what the limitations of your study were and then how they may or may not have impacted your results, um, that would be like, that would be top notch. Um, and then a concluding paragraph would be highlight your key findings and then recommend future studies. What needs to be done? What needs to be done next? Okay, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit, talk a little bit about the well-written scientific manuscript. So in the thoracic surgical community, um, I've been called the grammar place and I'm okay with that. So uh, grammar and writing style matter. Don't let subpar writing interfere with awesome science. So use a topic sentence to begin each paragraph, um, introduction, comment section, introduce key concepts. Again, method section, study design, patients, measurements, analysis, and then results, main results, sub results. And use segues. Um, we found that these results are consistent with, um, an alternative explanation is that, you know, and so you can really make it flow, make it, you know, easy to read. And then, um, you know, condense the text. And this is where I gotta say, I learned a lot when I took an eight week scientific writing course at UCSF when I was in the lab and um, realized I was doing a lot of these things when I was writing my own manuscripts and it totally changed my, my writing style and uh, improved upon it. So if you have the opportunity to take a writing course um, and also have others read it, um, condense your text. So this is one common thing I used to do in order, in order to determine the overall survival of patients. Well, just write to determine the overall survival of patients. They mean the same thing, fewer words. Uh, avoiding density. So we get really caught up on acronyms in medicine. And I would say only use common acronyms. Um, here's an example. The effects of NSAIDs on PG synthesis in the GI tract are mediated through the Cox system. I think it sounds better if we say the effects of NSAIDs on prostaglandin synthesis in the GI tract are mediated through the cyclooxygenase system. So if you can just cut down on, um, cut down on the number of acron acronyms that you use. And then the other uh, helpful thing to do is when you refer to groups, you pick meaningful titles. So let's say you're doing a, a study of patients who are readmitted or not readmitted. Well, refer to those groups as readmitted and not readmitted rather than group one and group two, because honestly, when I review a manuscript, and I'm sure many readers think the same, you have to keep reminding yourself who is group one and who is group two. So it saves a step. And again, um, symmetry. So once you've written the whole manuscript, because a lot of times we write things in pieces. And when I write a manuscript, I write, um, I write my results first, and then my methods, and then my intro, and then my conclusion because you really want the results to be the centerpiece of your paper and you wanna get those dialed in, then it's easy to describe how you did it and then go with the intro. And then once it's done, read it in order from start to finish and make sure that all the sections um, flow and that they're, tell the reader what to expect and they find that in the next section and there's no surprises. So again, resources, scientific writing courses, I can't, I can't uh, underestimate the importance of those. Scientific writers and colleagues, some departments or uh, parts of the schools uh, and universities have scientific writers. Dictionary and thesaurus, I, to this day, if I'm ever writing a grant or anything, I write, I use a thesaurus. 
And then again, if you can get Warren Browner's book, who's not in the third edition, I would get it. So the peer review process, I think, I just wanted to throw this in as a something funny. Most scientists regarded the new streamlined peer review process as quite an improvement. So this is what it can feel like sometimes when you're the scientist and then you gotta go through um, the gauntlet to get your manuscript accepted. So switching gears to responding to reviewers' comments. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the reviewer's side and the author's side, and we've all probably been on both sides. But when you um, receive your reviewer comments back, when you're the author, just read them and then step away from the computer. Don't blast it out to the co-authors. Don't start responding. Just uh, keep calm and step away from the computer. So these comments are always should be constructive. So when you're a reviewer, um, you know, just be mindful uh, of all the author's hard work that they put into the study and writing the manuscript and be constructive. So I always tend to say, you know, this is, I highlight the good parts. I don't just start writing about what I think could be improved. I highlight what the, what the pluses are of, of every single manuscript that I review. So the reviewers should be constructive. Don't take the reviewer comments personally. This is a review of your research and your paper, not a review of you as a person. So after 24 to 48 hours, reread the comments and think about the responses. Consider um, then circulating the reviewer comments to co-authors. So example, if, if the reviewer comments are primarily regarding the analyses, then you, you have to meet with your biostatistician and, and re-review that. Okay, so reviewers to tend to select one of the following. Uh, it's usually either major, major revision, minor revision, reject or accept. Sometimes journals have sister journals that they uh, may take the, may not publish it in kind of the landmark or the, um, the flagship journal, but they'll put it in to a, 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 another journal that's associated. And then sometimes it can be accepted pending review by the editor or re-review. Typically it's some sort of revision is needed. <clears throat> and then honestly, usually like a, a re-review by, by the peers again, the same peer reviewers. So most commonly revisions followed by resubmission Acceptance of a manuscript without revisions occurs very rarely. I mean, I've never had it. I don't think I've ever talked to anyone who's ever had that. And I honestly think if you receive an acceptance like that, it may be an indication that you actually aim too low when selecting a journal. So do not be afraid of rejection. I, I was given the advice from my PI when I was in the lab that you should always aim for the highest possible um, journal that you think you could get your paper into. Again, I'm gonna preface this by saying that you also have to consider who you want, who is your target audience. If I just wanna submit a, a study targeted towards thoracic surgeons, well, I'll submit it to one of the thoracic surgery journals. But if I have something that may be more interesting to all of surgery, for example, I had a paper on 30 day readmissions using our uh, the STS database, which is such an outstanding database that I thought this would be a good uh, article or good, good manuscript for annals of surgery. So I went to the annals of surgery um, rather than our, our just, just thoracic uh, colleagues. And then, you know, if you can even aim higher, for example, if you're doing cancer surgery, if you go to the Journal of Clinical Oncology or Journal of Thoracic Oncology for us, those tend to have higher impact factors. So you have to think about who, where do you want to park this manuscript ideally? Who would you like to read it? And then aim for the highest impact factor. So here I say always aim for the journal with the highest possible impact factor, but with the caveat that you wanna target your manuscript to the most appropriate audience. So the impact factor is important. It's an index that reflects the frequency with which the average article in that journal has been cited in a particular year. So it changes every year. And it's actually just a proxy for the relative importance of a journal within its field. And so Annals of Surgery used to be, used to have the highest impact factor. Um, in surgery, but now JAMA surgery has eclipsed that. I think these are these are a little bit old. It might be from last year, but JTCVS Annals of Thoracic Surgery. You can look this up online. Just type in the the journal name, and the and impact factor, and it'll tell you what it is. So how to get started? You know, when you when you start to prepare your responses, just prepare a clean Microsoft Word document, cut and paste the entire review. Just thank the reviewers and the editors for taking time to review your manuscript. 
um, because this is all, you know, it, yes, it's good for academic enhancement and learning and, and all those things. But at the end of the day, no one's getting paid to review um, your manuscript. Uh, you can't get CME credits as a reviewer, um, but it, it's, uh, you know, no one's getting reimbursed. So it's really the peer review process is, um, is all give and take. It's important for our scientific community. And respond to each reviewer comment individually. Um, format it for easy readability. So I tend to put the reviewer comments in bold type and then I um, respond in standard type. And then if I, uh, if they wanted me to add a sentence or a paragraph, I put that in italics and I tell them where to find it. And respond to every comment, even if you have already responded to the same comment from another reviewer, because when it goes back to the reviewers, especially the editors, we have to read uh, all of the responses to all the comments that all the reviewers made. And sometimes there were five reviewers. And so if you say, well, if you're down to reviewer five and you say, I've already responded to this for reviewer one, then I mean, you have to like backtrack. So just make it easy. Um, and again, I, I mentioned if a revision uh, has been made to the manuscript, include that in the response to the reviewer and say, this is what we included. So it's interesting because even if the reviewer is wrong, it actually doesn't mean you're right. So what do I mean by that? The reviewer may not be an expert on the topic and they miss, may misjudge the importance of something and they might ask that it be admit, admitted. They may misinterpret a result and they may not completely understand what you're trying to convey. So sometimes it could be the author not being clear. This happens a lot at, uh, in it, the adjacent world of grant writing where you think everything that you've written is crystal clear but you run it by someone else and it's just not, not really clear at all. Um, so you could be the source of the above potential scenarios. And so consider what you can do to try to improve the paper and satisfy the reviewer and, and avoid explaining to the reviewer why they're wrong. So the peer review process is really a litmus test for how your manuscript is going to be perceived by the people who are actually going to read it, who read the journal. And choose your battles wisely. Um, several modifications will be requested a lot. You're either going to agree or you'll be neutral or you're going to disagree. And so if a change is requested by the reviewer and it doesn't change the intended meaning, just make the change. It sends a message that you consider their review, their suggestion seriously and just go with it. If you believe that the change requested by the reviewer will negatively impact your manuscript, then you have to respectfully disagree. So you got to stand by your science, but you have to really explain it, explain your rationale professionally, respectfully and um, use that as an opportunity to clarify your manuscript. Because it'll also clarify it for the future readers. And then respond to each reviewer as if the, that review were the only one that you received. Reviewers are selected because they have different areas of expertise and you're gonna get several different perspectives and each reviewer may focus on something a little bit different. So absence of criticism doesn't actually equal tacit agreement. And then reviewers may make diametrically opposed recommendations. So you have to decide which suggestion will improve your manuscript and then provide an explanation for the revision. Um, and, and don't make the mistake of disregarding both suggestions claiming that the reviewers didn't agree or couldn't come to an agreement because it's not the reviewer's job to come to an agreement. It's only each individual reviewer's job to um, review your manuscript. And actually the peer reviewers don't get to read the other reviews until it's already gone through the review process. So use, you know, useful phrases to, to use are, we agree with the reviewer that X, Y, and Z, but, you know, A, B, and C. Um, you know, we too were disappointed by the low response rate. We agree that this is an important area of research that requires further um, study. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's all meant to be cordial and um, constructive constructive feedback. It's all meant to make, I have never gone through a review, a review process that has not made my manuscript better. And I even received a very critical um, uh, responses when I submitted one paper. And they were so, I thought the reviewers were so right that I, I took that paper out of the review process and we added uh, more patients to the cohort and it made it even stronger. So, you know, take it, um, you know, really think about what the reviewers are, are trying to do. They're trying to help. So be grateful for the reviewers and the editor's time. Um, it's volunteering time. 
um, thank them for considering publication and then just be polite and thoughtful in responses um, to reviewers. And I'm just gonna put in um, a plug for our paper. We published this a few years ago and it was published in JTCVS and the Annals of Thoracic Surgery. It was uh, entitled Reviewing Scientific Manuscripts, a Comprehensive Guide for Peer Reviewers. And uh, four of us wrote this. It started out as a, a smaller project for women in thoracic surgery. And then both of our uh, flagship journals in cardiothoracic surgery saw the potential and asked us to write a, a full manuscript and, and they both published the same one. So that can be a useful resource for uh, reviewers. And last but not least, I just wanted to share uh, my favorite books. They're all from um, when I was uh, doing my master's in clinical research. There's designing clinical research and then the publishing and presenting clinical research book that I've been mentioning quite a bit. And then these, these books by Mitch Katz, which are study designs, statistical analyses, multivariable analysis, and then evaluating clinical and public health interventions. Those three books are, um, they're, really a clinician's guide to uh, statistics for scientific writing uh, and analyses. So they're really easy to read.